Hello, and uh, thank you for coming to this installment of the presentations I'm here doing here this year, 2018, at the Ashland Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. If you haven't been here before, uh, I work at Myrick O'Connell, which is a law firm that has about 70 lawyers. We're the biggest firm in central Massachusetts. Um, because there are so many lawyers, everybody gets to specialize because there's enough clients to kind of, that you can afford to specialize. And I do nothing but elder law. I don't think I have a client under 55 anymore. My median client age is 74. Um, and so the presentations that I do here are really meant to cover a, a number of uh, topics that are relevant to folks who are over 65. Um, and what I try to do in the spring is do kind of updates for folks of things that might have changed or things that I learned the previous year regarding basic information. And then in the fall, I try to do more kind of specialized topics. So the first presentation, I talked globally about Elder Law 101, the 2018 update, except that inevitably then the question comes up, but wait a minute, I'm single. Because my typically what I'm talking about is Frank and Mary, my, my make-believe couple Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul and Mary. And, the, and, and some of the information that I give works well if you're married, but not so much if you're single, either because you are just single or you are divorced or widowed. So today I'm trying to focus specifically on uh, the Mary situation. So we all talked about Frank and Mary and, and you know, they had a very simple goal in life and, the, and their, their goal was to be married, you know, they're married and they want to die and be buried in the backyard and they want to leave everything to each other. Except, you know, at this point we're saying Frank may have been wonderful or he may have been not so wonderful, but at this point he's a memory, he's gone. And so the question is if you're married at this point, so what do you do? What do you need to be dealing with that for which you'd want to talk to an attorney? Now I know you never really want to talk to an attorney. It's like going to the dentist, but for what reasons would you really want to, you know, kind of have to talk to an attorney? There were really three issues, dealing with life, dealing with death, dealing with what remains. And so we're going to talk about all of those. So uh, the, whether or not your kids are all wonderful, you know, and some of those families are like that. I'm, I was very lucky, I grew up in one of those. Everybody got along, and right? Or whether they're not so wonderful and people don't get along. And, there's, and the point is that you still have to kind of face some, some, some similar issues, right? So while you're alive, in terms of what you need while you're alive, as opposed to when you're dead, because when you're dead, I mean, there are a lot of theories of what happens after you die, but in none of them are you especially worried about your assets or who's arguing or, you know, that's kind of gone. But while you're alive, you need this. You need a power of attorney, you need a health care proxy, you need HIPAA authorizations, what are they? We'll talk about those. And you want a care plan. You need a power of attorney because if you are incapacitated, you want somebody who can deal with your legal affairs. Now a lot of times if you're married, you know, th this, this isn't an issue because you own everything jointly and you, know, you can kind of take care of each other. But if you're single, you really need somebody that you can name who's going to be able to go to the bank for you or go to, to sign deals for you. If, you. if you need nursing home care, to sign a document at the nursing home, to, sign, to call the insurance company, to deal with any number of little things. The reason why powers of attorney tend to be long is we tend to list all of those things that you may need to do just so that if you're dealing with somebody, they can't say, oh, well, this power of attorney doesn't cover me. You know, that's why the power of attorney tends to be long. So a power of attorney, um, you can name um, anybody that you want. You can name people in order. You can say sequentially, I name my, my daughter, and if she's not around, I name my son, and blah, blah, blah. You can also name people jointly and severally. You can name more than one person at the same time, right, jointly, and, and if it's just jointly, that means they all have to sign if they're acting on your behalf, or you can name them jointly and severally so that any one of them could sign while they're on, while, on your behalf. So if one's not around, the other one can do it. Now that leads to the question, what happens if there's an argument? What happens if the one wants to do one thing and says, oh, we're going to withdraw all the money from the bank, and the other one says, why did you withdraw all the money from the bank, you know? Well, at that point, if there is that kind of argument and you're still competent, uh, then they're probably going to talk to you. And, and in that case, you may want to revoke one of the powers of attorney. You could. You could revoke as to one or the other. Uh, if you're not competent, at that point, someone's going to need to get a guardianship uh, in order to have somebody be able to handle those matters. But the point is, a lot of times, that's a very handy thing. But remember, you can always revoke it. 
If you revoke it though, remember to notify the bank or any, any other entity that has some of your assets. And the reason is that a power of attorney, so if I'm, being a I'm the bank and I'm being asked to accept this power of attorney from a son or a daughter or whatever on behalf of you, uh, I want to make sure that I'm not going to get sued. Right? That's my major concern. And so I want to make sure that you have the power to do what you, what you are saying you can do. Um, and so in order to make sure that, that this doesn't become a big issue at the bank, the, the, the usual power of attorney will have a provision in it that says that if I'm the bank guy and your attorney comes in and signs a document that says that the power of attorney has not been revoked and that you're not dead, I can rely on that. I from the bank can rely on that. No matter what that person tells me to do, give them $100,000 in cash or transfer the money, whatever, okay? Now because of that, if you're revoking your power of attorney, because you don't want this particular person to have the power to do these things, you, ought, you need to tell those people. You need to tell the, the people at the places where your money is so that that person doesn't show up with your old power of attorney, claim that it hasn't been revoked, and get all the money. Okay? So that's the reason why you'd want to notify folks. But the power of attorney, you have to have it. The health care proxy and HIPAA authorization. So, and I'm going I'm to answer all, okay, I'll do questions during this now. Right, yes. Yeah, yes, sir. There is, there is, is there any expiration date on a power of attorney? No. No, legally a power of attorney lasts forever until you're dead or until you revoke it. However, we always tell people, try to make sure your power of attorney is dated less than five years ago because some entities, we've had this problem where, where banks or especially uh, insurance companies or brokerage companies will say, oh, this is stale. This power of attorney is stale, it's too old, we're not going to accept it anymore. At which point, what are you going to do? Are you going to sue the guy, you know, who's at the bank? Because he's wrong, but as, a, as, a, as a, an internal matter, they may simply say, we're not going to accept those powers of attorney, and then you're stuck. So you want to kind of keep them fresh, right? I'm seeing you and I'm no, saying... No, 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 I'm listening to this. Oh, you're actually listening. My mom has a power of attorney yeah. and she has dementia. So to yeah. have her do another power of attorney... It's problematic. It's a real problem. And I That's think right. Is now older than five years old. And so that and that and so there's and by the way, I've, I so the, the the issue is that that one of my great staff people, Cindy Cormier, whom you've met before, she's caring for her mother. Her mother's got dementia, and and so she's facing this situation. And those are tough. We I've had situations where insurance companies or whatever have said, we can't take the stale power of attorney. You need a new one. And I'll say, but that was the point of the power of attorney. It's a durable power of attorney. It's meant to last even if you're disabled. And I can't have her do a new one. She's disabled, right? It's a problem. I can't give you an answer to that. Can't give you an answer to that, right? You only, all, all you can do is say, talk, let, me talk to the, let me talk to the supervisor or I'll sue, right? Or I'll sue. Okay, so, 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 the, so that's the answer. It doesn't have to be five years. It can be, but you want to keep it fresh just so that that third party won't give you a problem, right? I, I'm going back. So, healthcare proxy, as opposed to the power of attorney where you can only name one person, where you can name a number of people at the same time, either or, you can't do that with your proxy. It's got to be one person at a time. So you name somebody and if they can't do it, you name somebody else, etc. Because if I'm the doctor and I'm trying to figure out how to care for you medically and I've, and I've determined that you can't make the decision because you're not competent to make the decision, I only want to talk to one person. I don't want to talk to a bunch of kids. I don't want them to be arguing in front of me. I want one person. And so that's why the healthcare proxy is one person at a time. Um, and remember, the healthcare proxy is only comes into effect when the doctor has said that you can't make a medical decision, right? And, and that is, and that is, and after that's come into effect, well then your proxy can get access to your medical records, et cetera, et cetera. But nobody else can. So that has really two, two kind of, negative consequences. One, if you are in the hospital because you went to the hospital, you're still competent, um, uh, but you want your daughter or your son to, to take care of things for you, to be talking to the doctor or whatever, technically they can't do that. They can't talk to the doctor or get any of your medical information because the healthcare proxy hasn't been invoked, right? Which is the reason why in addition to doing the proxy, what we are, and we, this came up a couple times this past year, which is why we're now also recommending that people do HIPAA authorizations. 
Uh, HIPAA is the, is the federal law as a result of which, which, which is meant to, among other things, guarantee your, the privacy of your records, which is the reason why the hospital and the doctor, et cetera, won't give your records to anybody unless they are the proxy, right? Or unless you've done a, a separate document, a, an authorization form that authorizes them to talk to the doctor or to talk to the hospital or whatever. The other advantage, so, so you want to do that so that even if you're still competent, if you want your son or your daughter to deal with these people, they can, right? The other reason why you want to do it, we had a problem this year, which I don't, if you were at the previous seminar I mentioned, where, where a, 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 a dad was in the nursing home and the proxy had been invoked and, there's this, and there was this sibling dysfunction and the, and the son who was named in the proxy didn't want to tell the, the, the other son and the daughter what was going on, right? And he said, and I don't have to. And he's right, he doesn't have to, right? And the, but the way you can resolve that is by giving them all, in that case three kids, all these HIPAA authorizations so that any of them would have the ability to talk to the doctor and kind of see what's going on. And so, and so it just makes it easier. It just makes it easier. And that way they can have conversations among them. It's especially a good idea if the kids are all over the place. You know, you got somebody in San Francisco. I mean, we have three kids. One's in D.C., one's in Austin, Texas, one's in Colorado Springs. So imagine we get sick, you know, and you're trying to deal with all this, right? So this way, if they've all got authorizations, any of them could communicate with the doctor or the hospital. And so if they've got questions, right? Especially if one of those people who is far away is a medical person and is actually interested in reading that stuff, you know, which of course I have no idea what it says. But, but for medical folks, you know, th that may be important. So you want to do your HIPAA off, and they are effective immediately. So even if you're in the hospital, um, competent, so the proxy hasn't been invoked, these folks can now talk to the doctor or talk to the hospital, okay? So now, if you're Mary, um, and you've got these kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and you've got those goals, you want to live in your house until you die, um, and then after that you want to be buried in the backyard, um, and you've got these assets, um, then kind of what do you do? And we're going to talk, so I want to give you, an, I want to start you with these assets so that some of these questions will make some sense. So um, Mary's house now, she's 75 years old, her house is worth $400,000, she has an IRA worth about three hundred. dollars an annuity worth 300 and bank accounts worth 100. So total assets are a million one and there's her income. Social Security, 2,000. Pension, 2,500. Total income, $2,500. That's the example that we're going to keep using as this presentation goes on. So does she need a will? Because Frank's dead. Remember they owned everything jointly before but now Frank's dead. So does she need a will? What she wants to do, as I said, is to give everything to the kids. Well the answer really is no. Um, no, she doesn't have to have a will because if she dies and, and she's single and she has these three kids, the rules that apply when you don't have a will, the so-called rules of intestacy say that you take everything and you divide it among the three kids. So really she doesn't need a will. And by having a will, she's not avoiding probate. Inevitably people say, oh, I've got a will. I'm not going to have to go through probate. Wrong, wrong, right? The purpose of the probate process is to decide who owns things that you own in your individual name when you die? And if you have a will, well then that decision you, you will have made through your will so that those will be the rules that will be followed. And if you don't have a will, then there were a set of the, the state has basically written a will for you. It's called the rules of intestacy. And that's what will apply, right? So in this case, Mary really doesn't need a will unless you know, she's got certain issues. Unless, for example, one of the kids has a money problem or a marriage problem or a disability problem because you don't want to know that when you die what you're really leaving money to is your child's creditors or the IRS you know or to the husband to the son-in-law you never liked in the first place right and now they're getting a divorce and you've left all this money to your daughter and now all of a sudden that money's in play or you don't want to have your son or daughter who has a disability find out that they're getting knocked off of their government benefits because suddenly they inherited all these assets so in those cases, you need to have a will or a comparable document, and we'll talk about that, um, to make sure, and then and through, your, and through your will, you put all that money in trust for the benefit of that child. Name, maybe you name one of the other kids as the trustees, assuming that those two get along, right? Uh, and if you do that, as long as the child who is the vulnerable one, 
the creditor problem or whatever, does not have the right to order a distribution of money to himself or to herself. That money is safe. It can be used for his benefit or her benefit, but no creditor or, 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 or disgruntled uh, spouse uh, can get to it and it doesn't count for asset counting purposes in terms of government programs. So if you have no will, it gets divided among the kids. So why then would you want a will? Um, as I say, having a will does not avoid probate. So the issue with the probate process, uh, it costs some, first of all, the, the point of the probate process is to make sure that the correct person gets your assets if you die. And so if you've got a will, then, then somebody has to go file a petition to probate saying you're dead and filing a copy of the will and asking the judge to approve that as your last will and testament because it doesn't count if it's your second of the last will and testament. It's got to be the real last will and testament. Um, and, and, then, and then everybody waits. Oh, well, why does everybody have to wait? And this is the main reason why people tend to want to avoid probate. The, the first per people who get paid through the probate process are not the beneficiaries but the creditors. And for obvious reasons, the system is designed to make sure that ultimately you basically don't, you know, not pay your creditors and just kind of sneak the money out. And so, and so creditors have one year from the day of your death to file a claim, if you have any probate assets, to file the cl a claim with the probate court uh, and to say they want to get paid. And if the, if the personal representative who is control, in control of the assets now pays that or, or pays all the beneficiaries and doesn't pay that creditor, that personal representative, used to be called the executor, is personally responsible to the creditor, right? And so that's the reason why if assets are going through the probate process, it takes a year to go through probate, a year and a little bit, because you have to wait that year to see if any creditors are going to show up. So the cost of probate is not really high now, it's about, but it's not nothing. It's about $4,000 around there, uh, the, the legal cost of going through probate. It takes a year. Um, uh, and also, if you, if, you, if, you, if, if you haven't specified in the will, if you own a house, as Mary does, that the person named in the will has the power to sell the house without getting approval from the court, or if you don't have a will, in either of those cases, the court actually has to approve that sale of the house, which just runs up the, the, uh, the legal bill. So for many people who speak to me who don't have nursing home concerns, but are concerned about avoiding probate, I tell them, well, you know, there are several ways to do it. The cheapest, the cheapest, is through joint ownership or the use of life estates. So if I own something jointly with someone, technically we each own 100% of that asset. And if I die, my interest evaporates and the other person is just left owning 100% of the asset, which is the reason why that asset never goes through the probate process, because when I die, I no longer own anything. It just, it, my interest evaporates. Similarly, if I give um, an interest in my, in my property, to my, in my house, to my children, uh, or to anybody else for that matter, and I keep a life estate in the house, that is ownership of the house until I die, but not after, at the moment of my death, my life estate evaporates, and the children own the remainder, which is, that's why they're called the remainder men, actually. So, there are these devices that you can use, very inexpensive, um, to avoid probate. There are, some, there are some tax and other reasons why you may not want to use those devices, but they are, it, 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 you know, you want to talk to somebody about whether those are going to be a problem, because if they're not, that's the cheapest way to do it. Um, one of the disadvantages, though, to doing it that way while you're alive is that, is that you have, by doing that, lost some control of the asset, right? I'll give you, a, you know, a cup, couple of examples, right? I have a, I have the, both of these examples are from, as many of you know, I do, I, I do a lot of work on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket. Thursday is Island Day. I always go to one of the, tomorrow, too bad, I have to go to Nantucket and see clients. Or to, no, tomorrow's Martha's Vineyard. Tomorrow's Martha's Vineyard. Right? So two, two cases from there. One of them is a lady who had called me, and I hadn't done legal work for her before. She's an older lady, and she had, because she wanted to protect her house for mass health purposes, and we'll talk about that, why you want to do that a little, little later on. Um, she had transferred this interest in her house to her child. She only had one child, so it was a perfect case for doing a, doing a remainder interest. Um, so she transferred her remainder interest to her child. She kept her life estate, and, and, and it had been a long time, and so more than five years had gone by, so, the, so and for various reasons that's good for mass health purposes. But she said she wanted to talk to me because her son just got a notice 
from the, the sheriff just showed up and the wife's suing for divorce. And she said, so she's like, if I got a problem? I said, oh yeah, you got a problem, right? I said, because she was about, at this point, 85, which means the life estate value of that property for purposes of analyzing it for various reasons is worth about 10% of the value of the property. The remainder interest, the interest now owned by the son, is worth about 90%. And the house is worth about $800,000. Not because it's a big house, but because it's on Martha's Vineyard. So now all of a sudden, 90% of $800,000 is part of this divorce issue, right? Because now that's an asset of the sons, right? That's not good, right? That's example one. Example two, another house on Martha's Vineyard, family had lived in, um, in um, Roxbury, in Roxbury or Dorchester, and moved to the vineyard, had always gone to the vineyard, uh, and then finally bought a small house there 20 years ago. Um, but they wanted to make sure it was protected for mass health purposes, and they wanted to avoid probate, by the way, also. And so they transferred this remainder interest to their three kids, and they kept a life estate. And time went on, and time went on, and time went on, so now they're like 80, um, and they still love their house, except that you know they're, fra they're getting a little more frail. They want to be closer to their grandchildren, and most of them live around Boston. So they want to, and they want to cash out on the house because the house that they bought, this little cottage that they bought, is in, is in Oak Bluffs and is worth almost a million dollars. They got no mortgage, right? And their income isn't really high. And so they told the three kids because in order for them to sell the house, either all the kids need to sign the deed, in which case there's going to be a huge capital gains tax, or the kids need to deed the prop, their interest back to the parent, parents, and then the parents have to turn around, wait two years, and then sell the house which avoids <clears throat> the capital gains tax. But the point is, in either case, the kids have to sign. And, so, and two of the three of them would, but one of them wouldn't. And so the parents said, what do we do? And I said, well, you got a real problem. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. That child doesn't want to sell. Um, um, you can't sell because that child owns an interest in the property, the remainder interest. There is this process through which you can go to court and do a petition to partition real estate and have the court authorize the sale of the house and then the money would get divided up. But I said, in that case, your life estate is only worth 10% or about of the value of the property. So you're going to get $100,000. The other 900000 is going to get divided among the three kids. And they said, oh my God. Well, you know, if we stay here, we don't have any extra money. Can we get a reverse mortgage? I said, yes. Of course, all the kids are going to have to sign on the reverse mortgage. Oh, well, he's not going to sign. Well, they're stuck, okay? So there are reasons why you may not want to do that, right? So you have to weigh that out, right? Because you, you, you know your family, you know, only you know your family. Um, and, and for folks who don't want to lose control of the assets while they're alive, but do want to make sure that they're avoiding probate after they die, this is what they'll do. They'll create a revocable and amendable trust, revocable and amendable. Um, she, Mary would name herself as the trustee so that she stays in control, she can, sign the, she can sign away the house anytime, bank account, she's the trustee, she can do, it's exactly as if she owns it. As a matter of fact, for tax purposes, she does still own it. This is called a grantor taxable trust. So if she sells her house, which is in trust, she still gets her capital gains exemption because it's as if she still owns it. And if she, if, she sells, if she sells stock, she still pays the capital gains. <coughs> Excuse me. And if she needs to qualify for mass health, because she needs nursing home care, all those assets are going to still be countable. Still be countable because she still owns them as a practical matter. But upon her death, she says in the trust, I'm going to name my daughter or my son or whoever as the successor trustee. And, and basically the trust would have all of the rules that were in the will. The trust would say, sell the property, divide up the money. And if she does that, then, then immediately the property can get distributed after her death. There's no probate involved, right? Uh, so, and, and so, by the way, all the creditors get wiped out. So I had a family actually in Nantucket. They had a similar, they big, you know, they had like seven kids and the kids were all happily married and grown up and stuff, except they all went to college. And so the parents co-signed on all the student loans. Now, you know, one of them became a doctor and one of them became a lawyer and those student loans are good, but a couple of others were more like the artists in the family. And so there's like tens of thousands of dollars of student debt that, it's never, that the parents are being chased for, right? And they're like, oh my God, you know, do we, do, and, and all they own is this house, basically. They have this wonderful house, but it's, Nan, and it's a little house, but it's Nantucket, million four, right? So I said, well, you know, if you put the property in trust, 
and you keep control over it, the moment of your death, the new trustee steps in, there is no asset that's going into probate, so all those creditors get wiped out, right? All the student loans get wiped out. So there may be some reasons why you want to go in that direction. <clears throat> now, everything a single person should know about taxes. Not everything, but a few little gems that you might want to know about taxes. First of all, there is no gift tax. There is no gift tax. So the, so the giving of money doesn't cost you any money. And the receipt of money, whether it's a gift or by a bequest because people inherit it, is not income. So, so nobody pays any income tax either. So um, the, one of the questions that often comes up, though, is avoiding the Massachusetts estate tax. Um, the Massachusetts estate tax, we now have the rare distinction of being the state that starts taxing estates at the lowest amount of any state in the country, right? A million dollars. There's no state that is now lower than us. Uh, increasing numbers of states have abolished their estate tax, but I wouldn't count on that in Massachusetts. You know, we need the money, right? So that's not going to happen. So let me, to understand the estate tax, you need to understand, this is kind of important because there's this bizarre system which makes no sense unless you know the history. So the Massachusetts estate tax, like the federal estate tax, was created like in the 1920s uh, at a time where people were very concerned, very much like today, about increasing accumulations of wealth in a set of like very, very, very rich people. Uh, and, and, then, and then having these people be able to just give these money to these kids who end up being you know, multi-millionaires just by virtue of being the kids. How is that fair? And so that was the concept behind the estate tax was that if you really got a big estate, some of that money should go back in the pot to support America and in the, or Massachusetts. And so at the time that this was done, the, the state created this, this chart because the tax was imposed on all estates above $40,000 because if you had more than $40,000 at that time, you were very well off, right? And they said, for anybody above $40,000, we're gonna impose this tax. It's gonna be a graduated tax so it's going to, the higher, the more money you have, the higher, the more you're going to pay. So on the first $50,000, for example, the tax rate was only eight-tenths of 1%. And on the next, like, $200,000 or 150000 the tax was like 1.6%. 1 and it slowly went up. Um, and so, as a, and so, and by, and that chart is still in effect. That chart is, this is, ne, the chart has never been changed, right? Um, and so under that chart, if you have an estate of $100,000, you owe an estate tax of $560. It's not a really big estate tax because the rates are so low. If, you're, if your estate is a um, uh, million dollars or $500,000, you only owe $12,004. If your estate is a million dollars, you owe $36,560. If your estate is a million one, you owe $42,640. So they're not like gigantic amounts and they go up slowly. So, then what happened historically is that over time, um, um, the values of real estate went up. This was the big item. The values of real estate went up, right? And so suddenly, if you had a house, you were paying an estate tax, you know? And, and people got clued into that, and they talked to their legislators who said, this is terrible. This is no longer a, a estate tax for the rich. This is for everybody. And so instead of changing the chart, um, what the state did was they, 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 they drew a line and they said the original line was $40,000. If your estate was more, more than 40,000 or less than 40,000, you didn't pay any estate tax. Well, they drew the line and they made it 100,000. And then later they made it 500. Then they made it 600. And now it's a million. And they said, if you have an estate that's below that magic number, you don't pay any estate tax, right? And right now it's a million dollars. And it's been a million dollars for a long time now, for well, of maybe 15 years, long time. And that's not going to change. I don't, think it's, that's, I don't think that's going up either, right? It's not going down, but it's not going up. But then the question is, so what if you have a million and one dollars? What happens then, right? Well, actually, there are several, there used to be several states, these, I think these are all gone now, where their tax in, was referred to as a cliff tax. It was a cliff tax. So they had a chart like this, and then they had a line. And if you got over the line, it's like you fell off the cliff and you owed the amount that was owed under the chart, right? So Massachusetts did kind of a modified version of that. They said, that doesn't seem fair, right? But instead, what we're gonna say is, if you get over 40,000, if you get an estate that's worth more than a million dollars, then you're gonna pay in your estate tax, the, you're gonna have to do two different computations. 
how much would you have owed under the chart, and how much would you owe if you were paying 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars, right? And, whatever, and the amount that you have to pay is whichever one of those two numbers is less, is less. So if you have an estate of a million dollars, you pay zero in estate tax. Um, if you're over that, if, like Mary, Mary's estate is over that, right? A million one hundred thousand dollars. So what she has to do is she says, what is the number on the chart? <clears throat> well, the number on the chart, as we already saw, was $42,640. Now, what is 40% of all the dollars over a million? Well, that's easy. It's $40,000, 40% of $100,000, right? Which one is less? $40,000. Therefore, that is her estate tax. So now, as you can see, it, 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 there's a point, and, it's gonna, and it shows up fairly quickly, right? Because you're already pretty close to the fact that the numbers are about the same, where those lines cross. And basically, they cross when your estate is about a million one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars around. And from there on in, the chart number is lower than the 40% number. Okay, so that's how the estate tax works. Now, you need to apply that um, to, so if I marry, so how do I minimize my estate tax? Well, one way is I can just give away all my assets before I die. Give away all my assets, every dollar. And if I do that before I die, even if it's the day before I die, remember there's no gift tax, right? Um, my estate tax is gonna be zero because my assets are worth zero. So I can just get rid of the whole thing, right? Or um, I can give away, say, so say I could do that. Now if I gave away $100,000, then what would happen at that point if I gave away just a check for $100,000 a day before I died, um, my estate would go down by, and I, there's one little reason why it doesn't, but I'm, it, this is about right. Would go down, in theory, to a million dollars, right? And remember, as we talked about, if you have an estate of a million dollars or less, there's no, there's no estate tax, right? But in this case, there is an exception, right? While you are required to file uh, an estate tax return if you, are, if you have assets that are worth more than a million dollars. The law says that if you've made big gifts before you die, gifts of more than $15,000 in one year to one person, and, and you've all heard that number before, I know, $15,000. You thought that 15, if you gave more than $15,000 to one person in one year, some terrible thing happens. And it doesn't. It doesn't. The only thing that happens is if you gave it away in this situation, thereby dropping the estate down from a million one to a million, you have not thereby eliminated your estate tax. Instead, you've reduced your estate tax to $36,560, which is the amount that you would have originally paid under the original chart, right? So that's the second way that you can reduce your tax, is you can simply give away a little bit, you can give a little bit of money away You've reduced your tax from what you would have paid, like 42 down to 36, but you didn't get it to zero. If Mary wants to get it to zero, while at the same time keeping most of her assets, then she has to give it away, that $100,000, in increments of $15,000 per person per year. Okay? If she can do that... So you could give each child 15000 That's right. So, so, she could the day before she died, right? Give each child $15,000, right? That adds up to 45. Now you've got to dig up some other people you can give money to. Maybe the, the grandchildren, right? You, maybe, you know, you need, to, you, need to add, you need to find enough people that you can give away to in increments of $15,000. And literally, she can do that the day before she dies, thereby eliminating her estate tax and saving the estate $40,000. Because remember, the estate, the tax on that first $100,000 was 40% of that money, $40,000, right? So it's a big deal. So she can do it. She can do it. She can do it in any one of those ways, right? And she can do it literally the day before she dies. There's no look back. There's none of that stuff, okay? Isn't that amazing? Bet you, bet you didn't know that, right? Now, how about giving away the house, though? Because remember, one of Mary's big assets is the house. So the problem with giving away the house, right, you can avoid the estate tax as well as everything else by giving away the house. But ooh, what about the capital gains tax? Okay, so, 
So once again, this isn't everything you need to know about taxes, but it's interesting trivia, right? So you probably know this system, but I'm going to go through it with you just once. If Frank and Mary bought their house for $50,000, um, strike that. So the way the capital gain system works is, if you bought something and then sold it for more, and you held it in the meantime for at least a year, then the tax you pay uh, on, on the amount that you made is called the capital gain. If you kept it for a, less than a year, it's just ordinary income. You've got to put it on your regular income tax return. If it's more than a year, it's capital gain. How much is your capital gain? It is the difference between sales price and basis. What is basis? Basis is what you bought, typically is what you bought it for. There are a couple of exceptions, but basis is basically what you bought it for. So if Frank and Mary bought their house at 50, for $50,000 many years ago, right? It, for tax purposes, they each got a basis in that property of $25,000, half of the 50, okay? If they sell their house, remember their house is worth $400,000? If they sell their house for 400, then they have a capital gain. What is the capital gain? Sale price minus basis, 400 minus 50, $350,000. Their capital gain, federal and state total, would be about 20% of that number or around $70,000, right? Except, as you all know, if you own your home, that you have an exemption by virtue of owning your home. That exemption applies as long as you've been living in the house for two of the previous five years. Okay? Um, and that exemption, if you're a couple, is $500,000. Therefore, Frank and Mary wouldn't pay any tax because their exemption is bigger than their capital gain. Okay? That's how the capital gain system works. Now what happens if Frank dies and then Mary sells her house? Well, at the moment that Frank dies, his basis in his piece of the house, his half, jumps to the date of death value. In this case, the house is worth $400,000. So his basis jumps from $25,000 to $200,000, half of $400,000. Her basis is still $25,000. So if she then decides to sell the house, her basis is $225,000. If she sells for $400,000, her capital gain is $175,000. Except, remember, she's an owner. She's a homeowner, so she gets her exemption. Her exemption individually, remember for a couple it was $500,000? Guess what? For her exemption, it's half of that, two fifty. dollars So her exemption is higher than the capital gain. Therefore, she doesn't pay a tax. But what if she gives the house to the kids? If she gives the house to the kids, she, by, for, according to tax law, she is giving them her basis. She's giving them her basis. They don't pay any tax when they get the house, <clears throat> but they get her basis. And when they go to sell the house, if they sell it for $400,000, whether it's before or after she dies, they're going to pay the tax. They're going to pay the $70,000. If, on the other hand, the kids inherit the house, if they get it as a result of her death, at the moment of her death, just like, remember what happened with Frank? The moment of her death, the basis steps up to the date of death value. Now the basis is $400,000. They sell for $400,000, they pay no tax. That's the reason why you always get advised by your lawyer, don't give the kids the house, <laughs> right? Because you're going to give them this, if you, unless you have to, because you're giving them this huge potential tax liability, right? So the question that you, that you need to balance if you're married and you've got a house among other assets, right? Is whether you want to avoid the estate tax by giving them the house, right? Or whether you want to keep the house knowing that as a result of keeping the house, you're, you're going to get this jump in, ba the kids are going to get this jump in basis and so they're not going to have to pay the capital gains tax. In the end, is there the correct answer to that? There is no correct answer. It's a math problem. You actually have to figure that out. You know, and figure out kind of what the house is worth, what your basis is, and then you can figure out whether it's better to keep the house, as far as the kids are concerned, or to give it away, okay? Um, so your, Mary's other goal, while she's alive, is to not run out of money. Um, now, in general, there are a few tools that she should be using in order to not run out of money. One is a reverse mortgage. I've talked about reverse mortgages here before. There are huge myths about reverse mortgages and how terrible they are, and if you give a bank a reverse mortgage, they get your house. They don't, right? Um, and, and, and 
basically, a reverse mortgage is simply a, a line of is a is a home equity loan. Is a home equity loan on which you don't have to make the payments, right? You go to the you go to the bank or whatever the entity that's giving you the reverse mortgage. You get an appraisal on the house. The, 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 you, you, get in, you get a line of credit on the house that is worth a percentage of the value of that house. It's a percentage based on your age, right? The older you are, the bigger the percentage they'll give you because they know that you're going to die soon, right? And, the reverse, and the, the reverse mortgage, as opposed to your regular line of credit, is due only in one of three cases. If you sell the house, if you die, in which case the, the mortgage has to be paid within one year of date of death, um, and, and, or, or, I'm sorry, um, or if you stop living there for 365 consecutive days. So if you have done this, you've done this reverse mortgage, and then you end up going to a nursing home. What I tell the kids is, you gotta bring Ma back to the house once a year, right? Take a picture, newspaper picture, you know, because as long as she's there, one, once out of every 365 days, the reverse mortgage doesn't get called. So the reverse mortgage is a way to be dealing with that problem. You can defer your taxes on your house. I forgot to do something regarding this. So the way this works is as long as you've been a resident of the, of the, of the town, of Ashland for five, at least five years, and a resident of the Commonwealth for at least 10, and, if, and, and, you're, over, and you're 62 years of age of older, or older, the, the town has to allow you to defer your taxes as long as your income is below a certain amount. And the state says that that amount cannot be lower than 20,000, or no, cannot be higher than what is now around $70,000, or lower than $20,000, but otherwise the town decides. And I didn't stop at the assessor's office like a dope today, I didn't stop to find out what that number is. So when this presentation goes on TV, I'm going to have like a banner on this present that says what that number is. And if you email, you've got my contact information. If you're really interested in this, just email me or call me and I'll get you that number. Because it varies all over the place. I know that in Hudson, for example, otherwise very, very senior friendly community, they've never raised that number. The number is still $20,000. In my community in Marlboro, the number is almost, is, is over $70,000, right? Which means that pretty much all seniors can defer their taxes if they want. And, the, and, the, and, it, and, and it's like a reverse mortgage given to you by the town. The taxes are only owed if you sell the house or if you die, right? And they charge you interest, but it doesn't get paid until the end, right? Uh, and the interest rate is also gonna vary. The, the, the Commonwealth says that they can't charge you more than 8% a year, uh, but each town gets to decide their own rate. Um, many communities charge zero. That's I think what Marlboro charges. Um, so it's a, because it's basically, the w a way for the town to be saying, you know, we really like you. You know, you're like, you know, you're the bedrock of the community. You know, you bought houses here, you paid your taxes, and therefore we want you to be able to keep your house. And that's what that tax deferral is. Um, staying home when you need help. So there are a number of things you can do, right? One of the things, if you're married, is before you get to be like 70, you want to check and see if you can buy long-term care insurance. The reason why you want long-term care insurance um, did I talk about this individually? No. Um, is especially if you want to stay home. Long-term care insurance, which was originally thought to be the way that you were going to pay for a nursing home, like never pays for the nursing home because it's just way too much money to buy a policy that covers the nursing home. But if you want to stay home, what long-term care insurance, the, other, the great other thing that long-term care insurance provides is the payment for the home care people to keep you at home which is especially important if your husband's dead, right? Um, because if you're, so, so around here, uh, you know, the market rate home for a home care person, $25 an hour, right? The, and, and, and the typical, uh, a long-term care insurance policy, typically, you, I'll see payments from $100 to $200 a day, right? And at $25 an hour, that's four to eight hours a day. So unless you are really frail, this long-term care insurance may very well allow you to stay at home. Um, if, you, if you only need a little bit of help at home, then there is a state-funded program um, that will, that, and you've probably all heard about it, through Bay Path Elder Services, and I think I'm going to come here in the fall with the folks from Bay Path just to talk about the programs that are available to you. Uh, but there's a program that will pay for up to 10 hours of care, basically, at home a week, um, and there's no asset limit on that program, and you pay a copay. 
There's also a program that will help you do, do repairs at home if you've, if you've got some disabilities, up to $30,000, interest-free, interest-free. Um, and beyond that, you want to, call, you want to talk to BayPath. If you want to stay at home and you need a lot of help, you can, except that there's an asset limit on this one, right? Through a program called the Frail Elder Waiver. Basically, the state says, if you need help regularly, physical help with at least two of the activities of daily living, which are dressing, eating, bathing, toileting, and transferring. Transferring is getting up, getting across the room, sitting down. If you need help with at least two of those, or if you need regular supervision, because otherwise you might kind of wander away, um, then that's the criterion by which Mass Health decides whether or not they'll pay for nursing home care. It's also the criterion by which they'll decide whether or not they'll pay for a lot of for whatever care you need at home in order to keep from going to the nursing home. The program itself, the frail, it's called the Frail Elder Waiver Program, does not have any limit on the number of hours that they can give you. And I know of cases, not many, where they've actually given people 24-hour care. Typically, though, they won't allow more than 50 hours a week. But 50 hours a week is a lot. That's a lot of care, um, especially if you're combining that with long-term care insurance because you can, you can have some hours that are paid by the Frail Elder Waiver or th by Mass Health, and then you can have some other hours that are paid through your long-term care insurance policy. The issue with the, the, the um, Frail Elder Waiver, just like with nursing home care, is that if you have assets, and in this case Mary does, you can't, you, you, gotta, you can only have, you can't have assets of more than $2,000. You cannot have assets worth more than $2,000. Now, Mary, could, if she wanted to, take the assets that she has and restructure them so that she can get below that number and thereby immediately qualify for mass health. She could do that by putting the money into a so-called D4C pooled trust. This is a long presentation, so I can't go into detail on that. And basically, that money, if once she does that, can be used to supplement her care in any way for as long as she lives. Mass health will have a lien on that money after she dies, but in the meantime, she'll be able to get the mass health hours paid and then have this big pot of money left to pay, to pay for additional care. Uh, similarly, she can buy an annuity. She could buy an annuity and, and through the annuity with, with her cash, turn her cash, which puts her over the asset limit, into an income stream in order to also give her more money to pay for care while at the same time qualifying for mass health. Now, if you're trying to qualify for this program, there is also a financial eligibility requirement. Uh, if your income is more than $2,250 per month, you're going to have to pay a big um, deductible. You, you would think that's the cutoff. If you're below that number, then, you, then there's no deductible. You would think if you were a dollar over that cutoff number, the deductible would be a dollar per month, but it's not. It's actually whatever your earnings are minus about $500. So in Mary's case, you may recall her income was about $2,500 a month. Um, so in this case, she would be over that number and her deductible would be about $2,000 a month. So this program would not make sense for her unless she needed a lot of care at home. But if she did need a lot of care at home, right, and she'd put other money aside in order to supplement that with additional hours of care, this could still make sense for her. Now, if, and, and, and if she was, if, what, 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 an interesting piece of trivia on this is, if she, if, the question is if she's paying all of this money for care, as her deductible, how does she maintain her house, right? How does she eat? Well, one way would be if she had done that reverse mortgage so that she knew there was another, another, another stream of money that she could use to maintain herself at home. So what if you're going to assisted living? What if Mary just can't live at home, but she feels that, but she doesn't want, you know, but, and, and even with a lot of home care, and she's like, home care is just such a, you know, it just, it's not safe to be at home. She can also go to assisted living. Um, assisted living facilities are not, you're not eligible for that frail elder waiver um, benefit, right? And assisted living facilities, typically, you look at them and you say, you don't even look. You go, oh my God, this is going to be too expensive. It's just going to be too expensive because assisted living facilities will cost you between $3,500 and $10,000 a month. It's a lot of money. It's going to be a lot of money. But I guess I would just mention a couple things to you here. If you're in that situation and you're trying to figure it out, 
You, want to, you really want to be at home, but you're getting more frail, and you say, geez, I just can't, except that you definitely don't want to go to a nursing home, right? And you're trying to figure it out. Do the math to see whether this works for you, and talk to somebody about it. First of all, if your, you or your spouse was a veteran and served during a period of war, which most veterans did because the periods of war have been so gigantic, right? then you're going to be entitled to a benefit of between $1,000 and $2,000 per month. And if you can show that you need assistance with one of the activities of daily living, that benefit applies if you're in assisted living. So most, I, I heard a statistic from one person that said something like 70% of people who are in assisted living are getting this benefit. That's the reason why they can afford it, right? Because say you're married and say the assisted living is $5,000 a month. And remember her income is $2,500. With this benefit, now she's at $3,500. Now the amount left that she needs per month is only $1,500 or $18,000 or, or $18, a year. She's got enough in savings, right, especially if she sells her house, to live there for 20 years, right? So it's like it's a, it's a valid option. I'll just mention one other thing, um, um, the tax deduction. If, if, if you are in assisted living and your doc, because your doctor says that you should be there, and you can show that you need substantial assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, why does this sound familiar, or, they, or that you need supervision, then the entire assisted living bill is a medical deduction, a medical deduction, which means for, the, for Frank's IRA, that Mary would like never touch it because she, you know, that she'd say, oh my God, I'm gonna have to pay all these taxes. You pull the IRA money out, you pay, use it to pay the assisted living, you're using 100% of those dollars because you're not having to pay the tax because there's a, there's a, it's a huge medical deduction for paying for the assisted living. So that, that kind of option makes sense. Um, if you need nursing home care, you've all heard this before. You need to have, show you have assets of less than $2,000. Um, and the only way that you can protect those assets is by giving them away. And we all know there's a five-year look back period regarding giving those assets away. Um, and if you give them away and you try to qualify during that five-year look back period, what happens is it isn't like the state takes the money. The state just says, we're not going to qualify you for MassHealth um, until you can show that you've been there for a period equal to the amount that you gave away. And the way they calculate it is they say, figure out the amount you gave away, divide by this magic number. It's $310 now, which is what they estimate is the nursing home cost per day. So if you've given away $31,000, they're going to say, well, you're disqualified for, from nursing home. We're not going to pay for 100 days worth of your nursing home care, right? So the issue is, what do you do regarding that look back? One, if you want to protect your assets and you're married, remember, you can just give it away, right? You can just give it away to one of your kids. There's no gift tax, remember? The receipt of a gift is not income. She could just give away everything, and five years later, all those assets are going to be safe. Now, we talked about the house. Right? If she gives away the house, that means the cap there's going to be a capital gain problem later on. Right? There may be some issues with that. And, of course, if she gives it away, the kids don't have to give it back. Right? Um, and so she may be concerned about those things. But the point is, if you've got somebody that you trust and that is in good financial shape, you can just do that. That's the cheapest way to do all of this stuff. Um, we already talked about the house. There may be some issues with doing the house. You may... If, if you are concerned about making sure the money comes back, the other way to do it, and you've all heard this before, is you can put the money into an irrevocable trust. Name one of your children, the one you trust the most. That's why they call them trusts. You've got to trust the trustee. Give all, put all the money into an irrevocable trust. Name one of your kids. Make the trust say that the assets are for the benefit of the kids, but that the trustee has the option to distribute as much money to any one of the kids that that trustee wants during your lifetime. And following your death, the assets get divided equally. Remember, that's what Mary wants to do, right? And, at, and, and then, if you need money, presumably you've given the money to the, tr presumably you trust the trustee, so the trustee can at any time then write herself, typically it's a girl, right? Write himself or herself a check for some of that money. And remember, there's no, gifting is not a problem. There's no tax as a result of that. And then, he, and then she, as an individual, can give it back to you or can use the money to pay for your nursing home care or whatever. And there's no tax as a result of that, right? So that's, that is the traditional irrevocable trust option. I'm not going to go through those. And we already talked about that. 
and I'm not going to talk about that. Um, you, and you can also do some kind of combination. You could transfer some of those assets into trust and you could just give some of the assets to the kids. Um, long-term care insurance, I'm going to just mention regarding nursing home care. If you've bought a long-term care insurance policy, as I said to you, you don't want to buy it typically to pay for the nursing home. You may want to buy it though to protect the house. We have mentioned this before. If, if you buy a policy, a long-term care insurance policy, that has, will, cover, will pay for at least two years of long-term care at a rate of no less than $125 a day, and you then end up going to a nursing home, and, what, and you can qualify for Mass Health while keeping your house, and there'll be no lien on the house, which is the reason why a lot of folks do it. I am now, I'm out of time, I've run out of time, but I'm almost out of slides too. So, are there any questions regarding any of that? I know we covered a tremendous amount of stuff. Well, listen, thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you in the fall, and I'll be glad to st I'll stay here and answer any other questions, but I've got to stop because my, my time is up. Thank you.